Heaven filled my soul. He made my heart alive. And the things that made me whole, I'll tell you. Just a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. He makes it right. Down mm, your eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus, He'll watch His day and night. Just go to Him in prayer, and everything will be all right. I'll tell you, just a little talk with Jesus, just a little talk with Jesus, just a little. Please join me in prayer. Father, before Jesus, we were prisoners of sin and darkness. We were in bondage. We were slaves to sin. We were in the world without hope. We were alienated from you. And we were under judgment. Eternal death, hell, was all we had to look forward to. But when Jesus came, he set us free from the law of sin and death. We are no longer under sin's bondage. 
When Jesus came, he tore down the middle wall of separation, and now we have fellowship with you. When Jesus came, he set us free from judgment. Now we are holy and beloved by God Almighty. Yes, everything is right with Jesus. Everything is all right with Jesus. In his name, we have gathered together to praise you for the gift of your only beloved son who loved us and gave himself for us. Because of Jesus, we have gathered together to make much of the God who loves us and sent us our Savior. May you be glorified. Help us to praise you in spirit and in truth. May our worship be right today. May everything be to your praise and to your glory in this worship service. In Jesus' great name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We should all come with such enthusiasm for worship as John has just demonstrated. The choir and the orchestra hope to have shown you that this is a great place to be. For in this place we are going to hear the word of God opened before us. And here is what the Word says about itself. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This morning, the Word of God is going to be opened, and your motives and intentions are going to be revealed by examining the perfect law of liberty. But don't lose hope. For he goes on to say, we have a high priest who's in heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. And he is not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, but yet without sin. The conclusion then is, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace. So yes, the Word of God is going to reveal a problem, but the grace of God is going to show us the solution in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing and draw near to His presence.
The reason we can come and praise the Lord is because the Lord, the Father, sent his Son and took upon himself the punishment of our sin that we might approach the throne of grace with confidence. For we come not by our own works, but his, his shed blood. Let's recall his beautiful sacrifice and glorious resurrection, the Savior of the world.
Christ is the solid rock. All other ground, shifting sand, I'll stand upon the solid rock. Christ alone. Y'all please remain standing while we read the scriptures. It will be in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 today. 
I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not adhere sound doctrine. But waiting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in according to their own desires. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. We at First Baptist want and do preach the word in season and out of season. We are proclaiming not to tickle the ears, but that, we, that the world may know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through Him. And that is only possible because of your generosity. We want to ask you in this time, we're going to receive the tithes and the offerings. And if you're a visitor here, we want to do nothing else except proclaim the gospel to you and get to know you and ask that you would turn from your sin and trust in this free gospel. And then for us who are church members, we want to ask that you continually, faithfully, and generously giving your tithes and offerings so that we may continue in this work. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to be the people who are found tickling the ears just because we want to say what we want to hear, but we want to hear from you and hear from your word. And your word is a living and active word, and I pray that you would use it this morning to convict us of our wrongdoing and cause faith to be well up inside of us that we may trust in you. And I pray that you would bless this offering for the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
First Baptist, good morning. It's good to be with you on this Sunday morning. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. We are looking at the life and times of Jesus Christ. We are looking at his life and times as they are told to us by the apostle Matthew. We're looking at them because we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus change our lives. We want to see Jesus change the lives of every person in our family and every person in our city. And we want to see him. We come now to Matthew chapter 5, which is one of the most interesting parts of Matthew's gospel. It's one of the most famous parts as Jesus begins to preach a sermon. So not only are we looking at who Jesus is and what he does in these times together, we also get to listen to what he says, and we have these words preserved for us. We come to the very beginning of it in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. We're just looking at these first two verses before we start getting into the rest of it. But this, this morning, is what God says. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, let's pray. Father, we confess that we do walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In a sinful and in a fallen world, there is death all around us. But for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ, there is something nearer to us than death, and it is you. Father, we thank you for the life and the hope that we have in Jesus. We pray that it is life and hope that would spread again to this city. Father, it's life and hope that we can see and that we can hear. And so, Father, as we turn our attention to Jesus this morning, as we turn our attention to his truth, would you lift him up in our hearts Make us different than we were when we came in here this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you the story of a freshman in high school with whom I am familiar. 14-year-old young man who was invited to come to church by some of his friends at his high school. He received the invitation at school one day and accepted it. He said yes. He said yes that he would go with them to church because he didn't have anything better to do. He said yes, he would go with them to church because he liked them and wanted to make their friendship. 
he said yes because he didn't want to tell him no. So he shows up at church on uh, the first Sunday. Uh, church was not something his family did together. He might have been to church a few times here or there, but never with any regularity and never with a sense of what was happening there. And as he sat there on that first Sunday, he watched everything unfold and he sang the songs and he heard the prayers and he wasn't really sure what was happening. But the strangest thing for him happened about midway through the service when this man walks up and stands behind a desk and he started talking for 30 or 40 minutes, whatever it was. And it occurred to him that he had never seen anything like that before. He was a little puzzled that all these people were gathered around that desk to hear a guy talk for a little while. Well, he made it through that first week and he was invited to come back. So he came back and then he came back again and then he came back again. And what had been kind of a surprise as this man stands to speak became a curiosity and then became a source of interest, and then became a source of fascination. And what happened over the weeks and the months that he followed these friends of his to church is that every time that man stood to speak, he came to figure something new out about himself. He came to understand that he was a sinner. Over the weeks and months of visiting with his friends, he came to understand that the fact that he was a sinner was really bad news because God was holy, God was righteous, and God was not going to tolerate his sin. He came to realize over the weeks and months that he visited that God, though he was angry about sin, was a God of mercy and love and had made provision for sin by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross and to raise from the grave. He came to realize over the weeks and the months of listening to this man preach that he could turn to Jesus Christ by repenting of his sin, turning from his sin and trusting in what Jesus did and it would become his and he could live forever. What at first seemed like a strange occurrence. A man walking up, standing behind a desk and talking, came to be for this high school student I know, a source of light and life, encouragement, and even eternal salvation. What happened in that young man's church happens every week in this church. We sing and we pray and about midway through the service, somebody stands up here and talks about the Bible for a little while. What happens in that young man's church and what happens in this church is what happens in churches all over the world, all over this country, and has been happening for thousands of years. It is the ministry of preaching and teaching. And it is central to who we are as Christians. It is central to what we're doing as a church. And in God's kindness, it always will be until he returns. If you wonder, maybe you've been coming to church for a little while and you've never quite understood why we do this thing that seems to require so many children to color. Why do we do this thing? Maybe, maybe you're here for the first time and you are wondering, like that freshman in high school wondered, what, is, what are we doing here? I've been waiting all this time for that guy to stand up here and talk. Well, if you wonder where that comes from, you don't have to look any further than the text I just read to you, because it goes all the way back to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ here stands up on a mountain, goes up on a mountain where he takes a seat to preach. 
Jesus comes as a preacher of the word of God, and the first thing he does in the Gospel of Matthew is preach the Sermon on the Mount. It's the most famous sermon in the world. The hearers that day when he preached it paid attention to it. It has been read and heard and preached over the course of the millennia so that millions and billions of people have heard these words of Christ and been changed by them. We are going together to pay attention to this sermon as well. And this morning we come just to the introduction. And if you want to understand these first two verses, these words of Matthew as he describes what Jesus is getting ready to do, you can understand them with a sentence, and I'm going to break the sentence into two parts. Here's the first part of the sentence. Of all that Jesus could do, he teaches the people. Of all that Jesus could do, he teaches the people. The Bible says that Jesus saw the crowds. Jesus saw the crowds, and Jesus didn't come to make everybody's life miserable. The eternal God did not take on flesh to come and make life worse. He came to make life better. And so Jesus sees the crowds and he wants to do something. He's got an instinct to help. He's got an instinct to show care. And he does something. He could do anything he wanted. We saw in our text from last week a summary of the kinds of ministry that Jesus did. He engaged in one-on-one -on -one relationship with people. He taught and he preached. He healed and he cast out demons. We'll see those four things over and over and over again. It's not insignificant that of the four, the very first thing that Matthew details for us and that he describes at length is a sermon that he preached. He fills up three chapters of his story about Jesus with it. Jesus could have done anything. He could have found a way to give his life right there for the sins of the crowds, but he didn't do that. If Jesus had wanted to, Jesus could have looked out over a crowd. Maybe it was this size. And he could have said, you know what, for anybody in here who is sick, I want you to just be healed right now. And it would have happened. He could have done it. If Jesus had wanted to, he could have approached the crowd, seen the crowd, and he could have said, okay, I tell you what, for anybody in here who has a demon, I want the demon to come out right now. And the demon would have come out. But it's interesting that Jesus didn't do any of those things. He could have, but he didn't do it. It's interesting that when Jesus approaches a crowd, he never does a mass healing. He, he never approaches a crowd and does a group exorcism. Never once. When Jesus sees crowds in his ministry and he wants to help, he wants to do something that'll matter for everybody, he does what he does here. He saw the crowds and he went up on the mountain and he sat down. Now this seated position was a cultural issue where Jewish teachers in the synagogue, as they would stand uh, to move through the crowd to go to preach the law of Moses, they would get in front of the room and they would sit down. So when Jesus sits down, he's sending a signal that he is about to occupy the authoritative role of teacher and his disciples understand what's getting ready to happen and they come near. And in the presence of the crowds and in the close proximity of the disciples, Jesus sits and the Bible says in verse 2 that he opened his mouth. And he began to teach them, saying. The Son of God is going to sit on a mountain and do the one thing that he knows will matter for the good for everyone. And he preaches a sermon. That ministry of teaching 
didn't start with Jesus. It has a rich tradition going all the way back to the Old Testament, going all the way back to the first five books of the Bible. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 20, we have the Israelites leaving Egypt, and they get to the foot of Mount Sinai. What are they going to do now that they're out? Well, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 20, the Bible says, The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Moses went up into a glory cloud on top of the mountain to receive instruction from God himself. And having received that instruction and recorded it on tablets of stone, he brings it down the mountain to become a teacher and a prophet to the people so that they can learn what he learned. It was recorded on two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments were, and then we have the rest of it recorded in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses comes down having been taught by God as a teacher and preacher of the people himself. But it doesn't end with... Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, the Bible says, God says, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Moses is saying, I went up and I heard the voice of God from the cloud and I came down and I taught the people but I'm not the biggest show in town. There's somebody coming who is a bigger deal than I am. And you find out who that person is in Matthew chapter 5. As the king of the universe, the glorious Messiah, the son of God, walks up to the top of a mountain with crowds behind him. And as the sun glints off his face and as the wind blows his hair, the mouth of God himself opens up and through human vocal cords, the divine voice is heard. He comes as a teacher and as a preacher. It it culminates with Jesus, but it didn't begin with Jesus, and it did not end with Jesus. After Jesus goes to heaven and we read in the book of Acts, what was it that the early believers did? How did they spend their time? In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All those are important. But the point I want to draw your attention to this morning is that what the believers paid attention to was the teaching of the apostles. These men who had seen and heard Jesus Christ and they came as teachers and the people couldn't get enough of it. They were continually devoted to the teaching that extends down even to today in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction for the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. We teach the Bible at First Baptist Church, and we always have, and by God's grace, we always will, because in the face of a culture that doesn't want to hear the truth, we follow a Christ who comes, and when he has one thing he can do, he preaches. There's one thing that he knows everybody needs, and it's the teaching of the Word of God. I said you'll understand these two verses when you understand one sentence. I read the first part. We haven't talked about the second part. Of all that Jesus could do, he teaches the people because the people need to be taught. 
Why did Jesus do it? Could have healed them, could have exercised the demons, could have paid for sins right there. He doesn't do it. He teaches the people because Jesus knows what we need, and it's that we need to be taught. We need to be taught, you and I do, because we're messed up. Our brains are broken. Our minds don't work the way they're supposed to work. We don't think the way we ought to think. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18, God says, This I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. The Gentiles here, you should understand, is unbelievers. These are people who don't follow the Lord. They don't love God and His Son, Jesus Christ. That you no longer walk just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their minds. Their minds don't work. They're futile in how they function. It goes on in verse 18. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of their hardness of heart. You know what that says? It says sin turns us into idiots. It turns us into total and complete fools. We believe with all of our heart that things are true, that God says, nope, that's false. We believe with all of our heart that some things are false that says, nope, God says that's true. And we are messed up because our minds don't work, and our minds don't work because of sin. And we need to be taught the truth. We need to come in here every week and have our minds and our hearts and our wills reoriented around the truth of the Word of God because they don't work properly on their own. We need to be taught the Bible not only because of the nature of the problem, but because of the nature of the solution. God could have saved us any old way he wanted, I presume. He could have uh, zapped us with lightning bolts in the head. Would have been unpleasant. But he could have said that lightning bolt is the line between when you're lost and going to hell and when you're saved and living forever with joy. He could have tied the salvation experience to a thrill-seeking experience. So you jump out of an airplane, you feel the rush of adrenaline, and when you feel that, that's when the change happens. But God has not chosen to save us with an experience or with a feeling. He has saved us with the work of a son that is communicated in a message. A message that has to be heard, understood, and believed. In Colossians chapter 1, he is thanking God for the Colossians. And he says in verse 5 that he thanks God because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit, increasing, even it has been doing in you also since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and the truth. The message of salvation is that. It's a message. If you are to be saved, you have to believe the message. If you are to believe the message, you have to understand the message. In order to understand the message, you have to hear the message. And if you're going to hear the message, somebody has to say it. The way salvation works is with a message that is communicated and understood and it comes from a teacher and so we teach the Bible. The original hearers of this sermon needed Jesus to teach them. And we need Jesus to teach us. 
All of us are living our lives that are confusing and hard and troubling and chaotic. And we need to come in here as a body of believers and we need to sit underneath the word and be taught to straighten ourselves out from all the chaos and confusion. Uh, in the first Sunday in January of 2016, I preached my first sermon here. And the week before that, we were moving into our house. And uh, the work of moving in started with just me and my wife, and we were, we were working like crazy people, lifting boxes and emptying things and trying to set stuff up and painting walls and running around like mad. And it got about the middle of the afternoon on an early morning, and I realized I hadn't eaten anything, I hadn't had anything to drink, I hadn't taken a break, and my body was letting me know that it existed in a very painful way. And before I went to go do anything, eat anything, drink anything, I just, I laid down on the ground. And have you ever, have you ever like been working and your back's been, you've been doing stuff and you straighten out your back for the first time on something hard and it just feels so good to stretch it out and you can barely, you can barely breathe when you, I'm all alone up here, huh? <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> I don't see anybody that uh, understands what I'm going through. If, for the two of us who have, know what it feels like to have your back straighten out after a lot of hard work, that's what's happening here every week. See, life is like moving into a house. And you're bending over and your back's getting out of alignment and you're sweating and it's hard. Our lives are hard. There's chaos and confusion coming at us from every direction. We are having arguments with our spouse. We're having arguments with our kids. We are lost in our own thinking and we are tempted by lust and we're tempted by anger and we're tempted by worry and there's stress at work and there's stress with the HOA and there's money problems. There's stretch, stretching and pulling of our souls every which way. And when we come in here, the standard of the word of God allows us to reorient all of our lives and conform our souls to its true and wonderful standard. We need to be in here together to get ourselves straightened out. You need the teaching of the Word of God in your life. And I do too. And that's why we do this. You need it. I need it. The thing that has been breaking my heart this week as I've thought about our time together is how much the people who aren't here need it. The people who aren't here need the teaching of the Word of God. About 26 years ago, they built this room that we're all seated in. And they built it to hold thousands of people. Because this is and always has been a wonderful church that wants this city to hear the teaching of Jesus Christ and fall in love with Jesus as we all have. They built this room so that people could hear the teaching of Jesus. So that just as the king of heaven and earth rose to speak on that mountain, his voice could be heard through a human preacher every week at First Baptist Church. The reason we are trying to reach Jacksonville for Jesus Christ is because that is our mission every, much today, every bit as much today as it was, it was 26 years ago and it was 181 years ago when they first founded the church. The reason that's our vision is because it ought to break our hearts when we think about the people who aren't here. And if you want a reminder of who's not here, look at, the, look at all the blue in the room. Look at all the empty seats. A lot of them up there, a lot of them back there. There's room for a family right here. Right there is a family that's not here. Right here is the HR department 
at your, at your work. There could be a single dad and his daughter right here, but they're eating donuts this morning. They haven't gotten out of the bed yet. They think their life is great. As they get in their Cadillac Escalade and drive to Metro Diner and have a relaxing morning, but they don't know Jesus and they're dying. And every single one of these seats is a reminder of who's not here. Every single one of these empty seats is a reminder of a precious soul made in the image of God who will die and appear before the judgment seat of Christ and have nothing to say. There's a family that would fit right in that row back there and they live next door to you. You moved in next door to them, but they don't know what's happening. Right up there on the front row of that section in the balcony. You could fit two families up there. They're not here. They live on your street, though. Here's what I want to ask us to do. I want to ask us if every Saturday night for the next seven weeks, we'd ask God to go to bed with a broken heart about these empty seats an eight-year-old little girl right there, a 65-year-old man right here. We'd go to bed with a broken heart that they would have what we have, that we would be able to introduce them to the King of kings and the Lord of lords as his voice is heard every week right here through the preaching of the word of God. I want to ask you, one of the seven relational evangelism strategies of reach is a church invite. You've got seven weeks till Easter week. We're going to have the passion play up here. That's an easy invite. Come to the passion play. Listen and watch our church as we tell the story of the Bible through singing and acting. Invite people to church with you for Easter. It's an easy day to ask. It's an easy day for people to say yes. There are people who are waiting for you to invite them to church and they just don't know it. There is a woman who's going to be seated right up there because that's where you sit. There's going to be people who are going to give their lives to Jesus Christ and be changed forever. But you've got to give them another option besides donuts this morning. You've got to give them another option besides sleeping in on Sunday. If you want to see people come forward and trust in Jesus Christ, then bring people with you to church who need to trust in Jesus Christ. Don't settle that you get to sit here and listen to the Word of God and allow others to go without. That 14-year-old that I was telling you about, it's me. I'm the 14-year-old. I was the high school student. New at this high school and the three people that befriended me first went to the Baptist church across the street. And I went with them. That was almost 26 years ago. Right at 26 years ago, I walked in to Farmdale Baptist Church and I sat and I watched this guy do what I'm doing now. What in the world is he doing? Didn't make any sense. But God changed my life and my heart forever. Everything about me, what I'm doing right now, what I did this morning when I woke up, the kind of husband I am, the kind of father I am, the kind of man I know I'm not but I really want to be, everything about me has been shaped 
by the teaching of the Word of God because the contours of your life and my life are shaped by the truth of God in the Bible. You know people whose lives would be different forever from hearing the teaching of the Word of God. But you haven't asked them to come to church yet. This doesn't require you to even know how to share the gospel. It just requires you to care enough about the single mom whose husband left her two weeks ago. And it would be so wonderful if she were sitting right up there, but she's not there because you haven't asked her to come to church yet. About the 70-year-old woman whose husband died two weeks ago. She hadn't been to church in 30 years, but she's lonely this Sunday morning. And if you asked her to come to church with you, she'd sit right there. And she'd hear us talk on Easter Sunday about how Jesus Christ is not dead, but alive. They'd find out that Jesus Christ, this king who rose to speak on this mountain so many millennia ago, is still alive and changing people. He changed me. He changed you. They will never be upset with you for inviting them to have an opportunity to hear this king as he rises to speak. Let's stand and pray. Father in heaven, the strange, odd thing that we do every week, that we take for granted, the teaching of the Word of God has been used by you for thousands of years to change the hearts of individuals and to shape people into your followers. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that we'd be sick to our stomachs as we look around this room and we see all the people who aren't here. And we would see these empty seats as our stewardship, as our responsibility. And that over the next seven weeks as we prepare for Easter, that you would give us broken hearts and great conviction to invite those who live around us, those we work with, those in our family that we only see irregularly, that we would extend an invitation to come and be a part of what we are a part of every week. Father, I pray for the men and the women and the boys and the girls who aren't here but who will be and whose lives will be different forever because of King Jesus. Give us broken hearts and great conviction to do what it depends on us to get them here. And then, Father, we are asking you to do your work of pouring out your salvation that comes from a living Messiah. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We um, always have a time of response. Perhaps this morning is your first time at a church.
Perhaps this morning is the first time you've realized that if Jesus doesn't live and die and rise for you, you have no hope. I want you to know that he can be yours as you turn from sin and trust in him. We have men and women down front here that want to talk with you about that, that want to pray with you about that, that want to answer your questions about that. This time of response is for you. We want to invite you to come down from anywhere you are, back, front, middle, wherever, and talk to these people. We want to help you. We just don't know how to do it until you talk to us. So this is your opportunity. Maybe you are here this morning and you have trusted in Jesus and you are at church all the time, but you know, you know, you have been content to let King Jesus speak to you and not share that with others. And you're feeling convicted this morning and you want to ask the Lord for grace to be faithful over these next seven weeks to extend an invitation to our church for Easter or before. You're not in trouble if they come early. So whether you want to give your life to Christ or whether you want to respond with growing conviction to reach our city for Jesus, this time is for you. You come as we continue in worship and a spirit of prayer. assure you that we know how to end the service without showing a video. We've just had a lot of them to show. So here's another one. Have a seat and watch this. Over a year ago, I started promising you regular updates about the progress of our construction at our new Nocatee campus facility. A lot has changed since I started giving you those updates, but one of the changes that I am the most excited about is the addition to our team of our brand new Nocatee campus pastor, Spencer Harmon. We are so thankful to finally be here. It's been about four weeks since our family moved to Jacksonville and we have just been overwhelmed by the hospitality and the love that we have received from our family at First Baptist. And we are so excited for what we have coming up as we prepare for opening up this building to minister in the Nocatee community. Pastor Spencer isn't the only change you can see, but we are joining you surrounded by our brand new auditorium and our brand new building. We are just weeks away from our grand opening worship celebration. 10 years ago in 2009, First Baptist Church had its first worship service with its Nocatee campus. And we are thrilled that we're gonna be able to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Nocatee as a campus of First Baptist Church on Palm Sunday, April the 14th in 2019 for the very first time in this building. And that's gonna initiate a lot of exciting activity for the whole week. 
One of the things we're most excited about is our grand opening celebration that we are planning for Thursday, April 18th. So we're gonna have tons of activities for families. We're gonna have food. We're gonna have hot air balloon rides in the sports activity fields. We're gonna have bounce houses for kids. And we're really hoping that this will be an opportunity for us to celebrate and also an opportunity for us to build relationships with our neighbors. So we want to invite you to come and for you to invite all of your neighbors to come and celebrate with us too. And then just a few days after that, on April 21st, we are going to be thrilled to welcome our church into this facility to celebrate Easter Sunday for the very first time as a campus. It's an exciting time to be a part of First Baptist, and it's an exciting time to break in a new facility, even as we celebrate, together with the whole Nocatee community, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So I want to invite you to participate in all of those events on opening week for our campus down here. So as we prepare to move in, I wanna ask you to do two things. Number one, I wanna ask you to start spreading the word. Tell your friends that we are opening up this building on Palm Sunday, April 14th. Invite your friends to the grand opening celebration on April 18th, and then spread the word that we're going to be celebrating Easter in this building. But most importantly, I wanna ask you to pray. We are opening this building at a time when a lot of people go to church when they don't usually go to church. So would you pray that God would use this building that we're standing in, uh, that people would be saved while we're uh, worshiping in this building over that big week of celebration. I am praying for it. I wanna ask you to pray for it as we are excited to finally move in to this building in the Nocatee community. So you know you're clapping. You know this is a huge deal. I mean, we have been talking about this and talking about this and talking about this. And in fact, for those of you who were there for the groundbreaking ceremony just over a year ago, or right at a year ago, actually, uh, there was a huge pile of dead trees uh, and a big dirt field, which a lot of us got on our pants and in our shoes. Um, where that one of those big piles of wood is, is where the gospel is going to be preached on Easter Sunday morning. So this is because of you, this is because of your faithfulness. We are looking forward to welcoming hundreds of people uh, from the Nocatee community. So I want you to be in prayer about that. I want you to continue your faithfulness and giving. You've been beyond faithful up to this point. Uh, don't think because the building's done that we're good because we still need to pay for the building. So, uh, so keep being faithful. We're really, really grateful for that. Now, um, guest reception. Right through those doors to my right and your left, we'd love the opportunity to talk with you, to pray with you. If you've got a decision you want to make or a concern you'd like to address, uh, I'll be back there with other folks on our pastoral and ministry staff. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you. And last thing, people need to hear the teaching of Jesus. You agree with that, right? We should invite people to church, right? Let me show you how this works. Tonight at six o'clock, we are meeting for our evening service across the street. I'm preaching through the book of 1 John and talking about, am I really saved? I'm asking all of us the question, are we really saved? Are we really trusting in Jesus? And we're looking at seven crucial tests from the book of 1 John about whether we are really saved so that we can evaluate and see whether we're in the faith. I hope you'll join us back here tonight at 6 for that. There. Now that wasn't so bad, was it? You could do that. See you tonight at 6. God bless y'all.